Hey guys, welcome to today's podcast. In this episode today, I'm in conversation with Lauren Tickner. Lauren is one of Forbes' top 10 entrepreneurs, and she and I met when she attended my communication masterclass in London some years ago. We've been tracking with each other ever since. She is a lovely lady and a very successful lady, and she's speaking in this interview about how to turn your passions into profits. She's giving advice to all you out there that are involved in any kind of startup venture. She has a lot of great wisdom uh, for you guys. She speaks about some of her daily go-to routines and habits that have been part of the making of her. She also speaks a little bit about um, what it was like growing up with her disabled brother and how that relationship has been part of shaping who she's become in her career in just a beautiful way. You're going to love this interview with Lauren. She is a great person. And uh, thanks for being here in this space. Leave a comment, leave a review, tag me in on that. And if you don't subscribe, please do so. Thanks again for being here with me. Enjoy this conversation. Because watching and listening to some of your podcasts, I know you've had a two or three game-changing nudges towards what you do now, including yeah. your, including your feeling about your brother. Yeah. And your protectiveness towards him. And then you're fed up of, you're fed up of the corporate world when he did a bit of that. Mm-hmm. So I picked up two big nudges towards what you do now. Was it those things and other things that made you keep moving towards the sweet spot you're in now? Yeah, well, I was also overweight at one point, right? Right, so I heard you I talk about weight. that, yeah. Yeah, I lost weight in a really unhealthy way. And long story short, I ended up having panic attacks every single day while I was at school, age 16 and 17 primarily. And so my mom would have to come and pick me up from school early every day. And through getting to that point, I then wanted to become stronger both physically and mentally. And so that's how I got into fitness. And then from being into fitness, I started posting on Instagram. And people in my year found all this this account because I kept it secret for such a long time. And they literally tore me to shreds. I mean, I'm telling you, you can imagine teenage people when people are doing something that's a bit different. Because nowadays, everyone and their grandma, Susan, has a fitness Instagram account. Right, Uh, Right. Back then, people didn't. And so what I did is I kept it private, then everybody found it. And it was, you know, that feeling where you feel like you're being engulfed by a black yeah, hole. Yeah. Right, so I right. to stop doing that. However, I ended up continuing on with it because I just love the community. I wasn't making these posts on Instagram. I mean, literally, I was just sharing healthified recipes. That's what I called mm. them. And so mm. it was like, I was making brownies and stuff with protein powder and, and egg whites and whatever. And so I was posting that type of thing. It wasn't like, you know, all these butt workouts that people are posting and nothing like right. that. It was, it was like, you know, just, just a food blog, but I was still really embarrassed. But yeah, I continued on with it because I wanted just to make friends with other girls who are into the same thing, girls my age. Cause I was like 16, 17 at the time. And then from there, I got really into fitness, and that was also a similar time as when I went and started working in asset management, and I was simultaneously posting to Instagram, and I hated that job so much. I mean, so, so much, like that feeling, you know, when you're just really bored. I don't know if you've had it for a while, but I used to get it all the time when I was a kid, when you're just so uh, bored, I had that every day. But at what point did you know, I mean, at what point did you realize in that job that you hated it, and how long after that did you stay? kind of thing so there was one moment that I think was really really pivotal for me and I think it was just before Christmas time so I started the job in September and then it was around Christmas and I remember saying to one of my colleagues oh it would be nice to go on on holiday but I don't want to take a vacation because I want to save all my days of holiday for summer and then the man sat behind me he he piped into the conversation and he had four daughters and they were all a similar age to me. Some of them were actually older than me. And I remember him saying, oh yeah, we haven't been on holiday for, I think it was five years. And he was planning on taking them away that year for Christmas, but he couldn't, I think because one of his daughters got in a car crash and he had to pay that off or something because she didn't have her insurance covering it because it was her fault, something like that, I don't remember. And so I was looking around at the office and I noticed really clearly that during the Christmas period, even on Christmas Eve, the majority of the office was still there working. And I was like, huh, this is really interesting because I'm working at one of the top investment management firms in the whole of the the world. 
yeah, these people that are all around me, they don't have freedom. You know, they don't have the ability to go and do what they really want to do. Because let's be real, who wants to be sat in an office having right. commuted to London when most of the world is spending time with their families, but they don't have the ability to go and do that because they have to go to work. And I was thinking, huh, this is so interesting because if I continue working in this job, I was 18 at the time, if I stay here, what's going to end up happening is, I mean, well, I'm just working towards where all these people are at because I was the lowest of the low in that, in that company. I was the youngest person they'd ever employed. And so if I kept in that job, I just remember thinking to myself, huh, if I stay here, then I'm just going to end up just like them, you know? And so it was just this moment for me of realization that I was working every single day to get better at something that I didn't want to be good at. And it just made no sense because I had this whole other world where it was just on my phone. You know, I got my phone and I would just post to Instagram and I would comment to people and I was just, that was like what I love to do. And so I don't really remember how much longer I stayed. I think it was like five more months because <laughs> they kept telling us that we were going to get this bonus, right? And at that point, I was really motivated by money. And so what ended up happening is I actually handed in my notice the day after I got my bonus. And yeah, I left on the 1st of April because I just remember that because it's April Fool's Day. Um, and I think I got a bonus of like 2.5K and I'm like, oh, I wasted like so many months of my life just for 2.5K. But, I wonder what it, like, you know, yeah. looking back, what is it, what was it about, you say you were 18 at the time? Mm. So what was it about the 18 year old Lauren, number one, that thought that, but more importantly, did something about it because to have felt stuck would not be unusual for many people, as you know, but to have done something about it in the way that you did, to have a bit of a plan, an exit, an off wrap plan, to move to something else, even though you weren't sure what that was. That's unusual. And I, I'm wondering whether or not you feel back then this entrepreneurial leanings that you clearly now do strongly in was what was happening back then at 18. <laughs> it's funny. Someone asked me this exact question yesterday and I kind of just had this realization, right? Now I am arguably, and look, I'm not saying this to, to impress anyone, but it's just because it, it's just my personality. I am probably one of the most driven people that you could meet. You know, I just, I'm just like, I know what I want and I'm going to make it happen no matter what. And so it's funny when I say this because it's sort of contradictory. However, <laughs> I'm very lazy when it comes to actually like leaving my house. <laughs> right. And so I hated the commute so much. Oh my gosh, the trains were late every single day and it was just really annoying me and there was nothing more that i wanted to do i would look out my window in my office we were in the zigzag building by london victoria right we had pretty cool view and i just remember looking out and thinking the gym is just down there on that road down there i would love to go and work out right now because i my gym was just across the road and i was like I just wish I could go to the gym. That was just what I wanted to do. And so I just wanted to go and do what I wanted to do. And so it was really frustrating to me how I would say to my boss, I was like, okay, well, because all of the work could have been done from home, right? It could have, all of it was on the computer. Wow. I did not need to be there. We just needed access to Bloomberg and we needed access to like a couple of these other softwares that they had already installed in all of their laptops. And so it was just the old fashioned way of thinking. And so I think being, you know, 20 years younger than the majority of people that work there, I think I just saw the ability to take everything online before they did and they still don't get it, you know? Right yeah. now, going through the whole coronavirus pandemic, I'm sure they've adapted, but you know, if they had implemented these types of things 10 years ago, which would have been very feasible, then businesses would have been way ahead by now. So for me, right. I think it's just a case of realizing, like, I, I just remember thinking, this is just, this is just silly. And, and I just didn't want to work for someone else. Um, purely because of selfish reasons at that point. Yeah, I just wanted my own freedom. Where does your drivenness come from? Um, I think, well... And back then it was because I just wanted to be able to do my own thing, right? And I think we all get started for our own personal reasons. And then I think what every, every successful entrepreneur that I've spoken to or any, just anyone who is 
happy and fulfilled, you find that at the beginning you're motivated for something that is either for you or one of your close family members or friends. Mm -hmm. So it might be that you just want to make money because you really, really want to buy a nice house. Or maybe it's that you're motivated to raise money for charity because your sister needs a heart transplant, whatever. But then you'll find that to continue on doing <coughs> that thing, you need some sort of fulfillment through doing it. And so with regards to me, back when I first started, it was because I wanted that freedom for myself. And then I built a fitness business because I never wanted other people to go through the same struggles that I had been through in fitness. And then having successfully built that business, I then wanted to help others build online businesses so they could never work jobs that they hated as much as I did. And then now for me, it's like, okay, cool. I mean, I love helping people build online businesses and it is really, really rewarding. But when you do it a certain number of times, it sort of becomes predictable. You know, it's like a system, someone comes in, they do the work, they get the result. Whereas now I just want to keep pushing and keep growing because ultimately my brother has tons of uh, disabilities and so i've seen someone who has had their freedom taken away from them so i want to be able to make the most of mine to be able to firstly live my life but also secondly be able to ultimately assist in the overcoming of you know stigma around disability a cure for epilepsy and also um i want to build a business that is able to supply quality care for people who have disabled children in their families because i've been you know my parents got divorced a couple of years ago and so sometimes my the help my brother will go to my dad's house sometimes he'll go to my mom's house and i've been there because they'll typically go to my mom's house more often i've been there where my mom and i will get back from i don't know going for lunch together and the carer who's looking after my brother is just sat there asleep, you know? And it's just like, how can this, how can this, how can this be? You know, he's supposed to have two on one care. So this person, it's fine when he's just by himself because he was just, my brother's just like lying there watching TV or something. And this other person's supposed to be looking after him, but he has epilepsy, you know, if he had a seizure or something, this person isn't even caring for him. And so ultimately I want to be able to, build something which is really going to provide freedom to these families of these disabled children because i mean again it's it, you typically find drive in the things that have affected you right and so for me it's like well i have literally had half my childhood taken away from me because i wasn't able to do the things that a kid could do because my parents had to look after my brother you know um and so while these are things that are close to my heart for those reasons, I think that if everybody were to just look inside of themselves, inside of their families, inside of their personal experiences, and just find one thing that's important and meaningful to them, then I think that's going to allow them to really find what they're not, uh, it's kind of cliche, like put on this earth to do, but find fulfillment in doing something. So for me, it's been those three things me being affected by the whole thing with losing weight super unhealthily and having panic attacks, then working a job that I hated, and then ultimately my brother. That's my theory. When you came to my masterclass in London, if you remember, I talked about that section about finding your why, which you've just described, I think. Yeah. And the importance of that, I think, to give, I think the difference between the outstanding and the average is something to do with what you just said, is that the drive and motivation, essential calling or sense of purpose or cause, is often rooted in things like that, that are often quite private, yeah. that, that become this massive sense of calling and purpose that is, I think what you just answered was yeah. your calling, your sense of why behind what you do. Um, you talk, Lauren, quite a bit about the difference between working in a business and on a business. What's the difference? Well, I think ultimately, let's just take it back one step further. I think that, the majority of people in this world, well, they work a job, so they put their time into an exchange and the, the value exchange is that they work a job and in return they get money. Mm -hmm. And so it's really interesting because <laughs> when it comes to business and you start talking about money, people are like, oh, you're so, you're so money motivated and all you care about is money. Right. But a lot of people work jobs that they hate just in exchange for money. And so really when you think about it 
people's biggest addiction is their paycheck because they're going to work for something despite the fact that they hate it they're going back again and again and again just to get the money in their bank mm. and so i think this is something for a lot of people to look at and think huh why am i working this job and if it just is for money then fine but think well what is your deeper reason why as you just alluded to because money without fulfillment is never gonna cause you to live the life that you really really want to be living deep down inside some people get complacent for a period of time and they're like yeah i'm making money i'm able to go see my friends on the weekend i'm able to go on one vacation per year and they're cool with that but imagine this imagine if you were able to take the hours of nine to five every single day plus the commute and let's say that's an extra i don't know 10 hours of your day right? Imagine you were able to take an extra 40 to 50 hours per week and put that towards something that you're passionate about. Imagine how much more fulfilled your life would be if you're spending an extra 40 to 50 hours a week doing something that you enjoy. And I think a lot of people get confused and they get stuck because they don't understand where to start when it comes to building a business. Mm. But think about it this way, right? Let's say your goal was just, let's say in your job you're making, I don't know, each year 50 grand, right? Or mm. even less, like 30 grand. So each month, what's that gonna be? I mean, I can't do the math right here, but let's just say it's like three to, three to four grand a month, okay? Mm. So let's just say you were able to get a result for someone else. For example, you're able to help them find a new partner or lose fat, or find their own reason why, or find a good career. Well, if you were able to just get, I don't know, three to four clients each month, paying you like one to two K, that's more than what you're making in your job. And so even if you were just having conversations with people about your passion, so it's something that you enjoy anyways, you can then right. get them as a client and turn them into someone who is then your income, right? So your income is no longer your job. Your income is from another human who you enjoy talking to because it's about the thing that you're interested in. And again, like when it comes to passion versus, you know, something that's going to be profitable, we do need to be careful there because, you know, if your passion is, I don't know, knitting, yeah, for sure you can make your income from that. But at the end of the day, it might not necessarily be totally lucrative, right? unless you're teaching other people how to knit and you go for a type of market who is going to actually pay for it. But you see what I'm saying? So it needs to be something that people will pay a high price for. But anyway, just going back to in versus on your business. Um, I mean, working in your business is doing the day to day. So these are the things that in the future you can actually hire a team to do for you. And then working on your business is the things like we just mentioned, right? Finding your reason why finding a profitable market, looking at opportunity, figuring out what you can sell, and then creating the direction of where you wanna go. And so I think as a CEO, as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, it's your duty to work on the business, but at the beginning, you will have to work in the business until you have enough revenue and profits in your business to actually pay other people to do it. But at the end of the day, you can't keep doing it all yourself because you're gonna get burnt out. And that's when you risk resenting what you're doing you don't want that to happen you know you spent some time i didn't know whether you were moving temporarily to america or thinking of moving there long term um but you spent some time in the states uh, is it a plan for you to be there more regular yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i want to and if, and if so why well the mindset in the u.s is very different to here in the uk so in the uk you try and tell people hey i have an online business and they do not get it. Even now, they still don't understand. And if you have an online business, they think you're selling stuff on eBay or something like that. Right. And so I just like being in the US because the mindset is different, right? Where people support you rather than knock you down. And I find that in the UK, you talk about things like building a business and people just think you're a scammer. And it's a really interesting mindset. Like even listening to this right now, there's probably people thinking, oh yeah, this is a scam. It's not possible. It's not feasible. And I get it because I used to think that too. And so that's why I find it funny because I totally get it. I mean, I'm from Surrey, you know, my parents are probably like the most typical English people you could think of. 
And so I understand the mindset. And with that said, I think it's just the case of you have to surround yourself with people who want to lift you up. And I just find that I struggle to find that type of person in the UK. And I've tried to create communities around it here. And I am grateful to have been one of the thought leaders in the UK for women in fitness, which was really cool. I created like a whole movement around that back when I was, you know, between the ages of 18 to 20. But when it comes to building businesses and stuff, I just feel like the UK is pretty far behind in doing things. They just, when I get on phone calls with potential clients, um, <laughs> yeah, a UK person, they will, they will just make all the excuses in the world. Whereas people from the UK, like they're like, hey, take my credit card details, let's go. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think people that do what, I think people that do what we do, i.e. people that are sole traders or want to make a living um, in some unusual way, different to the nine to five thing, uh, that's to do with personal development, coaching, mentoring, uh, startups. There is this generic thing across Europe that is resistant to it. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you, which is why I love America so much and have a home there, of that entrepreneurial, outgoing, have a go uh, mindset in America. Yeah. I think is one of the biggest pluses of America. There's a lot of disadvantages with American culture as there is with UK. But one of the big pluses, I think, as you say, is that working online immunizes you to a degree, I suppose, from being nailed down to any particular geography, right? Yeah. So you, you can reach the world from your lounge, which a lot of people in the pandemic are finding out was always possible. Mm, yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Only through a global pandemic do people finally realize that you can actually do things just right. from your laptop. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, exactly. What do you think? Is that one of the biggest mistakes of startups? You think that they spend too much time in rather than on? Hmm. I think that one of the biggest things that people do, which is a mistake, is that they just, they just don't understand what the best offering is for their market and so a lot of people try to totally reinvent the wheel so many people think that to be an entrepreneur you have to be an inventor but there's a difference between an inventor and an entrepreneur an inventor is someone that creates something new an entrepreneur is someone who solves a problem for a particular market with the hope of taking a profit and they're willing to take financial risk to do so and so there's a lot of people who are entrepreneurs right they aren't willing to take on financial risk right they aren't willing to go ahead and actually put in the work to try and make it happen instead what they'll do is they'll think of an idea they'll go and research it for a long time they'll go and try and find a way to create it and then they'll fail and then they're like oh this isn't for me <laughs> and i've been one of those people you know i've tried to create brand new things and it's just i'm not an inventor right at this stage of my life maybe in the future i'll have a cool idea and i'll be resourceful enough to make it happen ultimately i'm an entrepreneur and so when it comes to thinking of the creative inventive like i can think of the vision whereas you need those people to be the ones who, who actually make it happen because if you're the one who's trying to create the vision and trying to build it then you're only you and you're you're the only one who's coming up with the, the decisions so what i've done through building my team here at Impact School is I have realized that <laughs> I can think of an idea, but if I'm the one who's creating it, I'm going to waste so much time because I'm, yes. I'm not good at trying to build out all of these fancy, crazy things, you know? So I think at the beginning though, I had to do it. You know, I had to, cause I didn't have enough profit in my business to reinvest back in. But I think the biggest mistake probably if I was starting again, that I would, go back and redo is taking out business loans to actually reinvest back into my business because then I could have mm. hired people sooner but I didn't really understand that debt is leverage I didn't understand the difference between good debt and bad debt mm -hmm. and so that held me back for a long time again a very very English mindset and UK mindset and only through studying finance did I really understand that what don't people, is there something that you think people don't know about you that you think is probably your superpower? Like, like it seems to me from 18, that drive, or some people would call it stubbornness, or whatever people call it, 
there's something about all of us, I think, that people perhaps are not aware of because it doesn't sit out there in the shop window of your life. But underneath, there's something about humans, I think, that people don't know that you know probably is your go-to superpower. I think there's a couple of things, right? I think the first one is I really, 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 really don't care what people think about me. Like, okay. I, I just don't care. Let's go. I mean, I'm very, I'm a very strange person, right? I'm very weird and I don't, I don't care. And um, so it didn't always used to be that way, though. Only through building my whole fitness Instagram and then everyone finding it did I really finally feel like, okay, my true self is out there in the world. So now I can just be myself. And so I think through putting things on social media, it's allowed me to become that way. Mm. And before that though, I, I, you know, I, I never even told my dad that I was having panic attacks until like a couple of years ago. My dad never knew. I was very afraid to be vulnerable because I thought that people would take me less seriously and that I would seem weak or that I would just seem like I was trying to get attention. Okay. So that's the first thing. Second thing is that I don't even think that they're habits anymore. They're my identity. And so I think that in order to be truly successful, happy and fulfilled, you need habits that become so ritualized. They become your identity and they become who you are because your identity is the hardest thing to shift. This is why people who are overweight, for example, maybe they see themselves as the fat girl, right? I used to see myself as the fat girl. And so I kept doing things that would be in alignment with that subconsciously. And so your subconscious mind is the most powerful thing. So now when everyone finally found out that I had this fitness Instagram, I became the fitness girl. And so every single opportunity that there was, I would go and do the exercise. I would go and have that healthy plate of food. Because when I was out in public, that's how people saw me and that's how I saw myself. And even with that, it's like, okay, I see myself as someone who is going to change the world. So is someone that's going to change the world in my own unique way going to be doing things that someone who's like a slob on the couch who just doesn't really care about much is going to do? No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to self-sabotage because I'm not the type of person that does that. But trust me, I never used to think this way. And so only through doing habits again and again and again and again and again do they become my identity and so you see these things where it's like it takes 21 days to build a habit i don't believe that i think for everyone it's different and it also depends on your starting point and so i was saying on a podcast the other day how i used to have this really bad habit as of like a week ago snacking in the evening okay and so it was really annoying me because again i i am very good when it comes to my fitness my health and i understand the food that i'm putting in my body and so on and so forth however i just had this habit of snacking in the evening and it was really frustrating me because it only happens when i'm here in the uk because typically when i'm traveling like i'm eating dinners out and then i'm just not hungry in the evening and there's no food in the house but i was like okay lauren look enough is enough there's only one way to change this we need to just get rid of this once and for all and so i started saying to myself you're not the type of person who does this. You're the type of person who cares about your health and you're the type of person who wants to wake up in the morning feeling energized and you, you want to make sure that you're eating until you feel fulfilled, right? And so rather than saying, I'm not going to snack, I'm not going to eat after eight. Instead, I said what I am going to do. So I added rather than subtracted because adding rather than subtracting is going to be one of the most profound ways to change the way that you show up. Right. So I just said to myself, you know, who am I? What type of things do I do? How do I show up? And so it's, yeah, I mean, I'm, I just have an apple and then I'm, I'm good. (laughs) But with that said, it's just, it's so powerful. And so it, it, it becomes something that you think about throughout the day as well. And so when it comes to some things that people probably don't about me, but maybe they, maybe they know it now because I make a lot of content is that I am very routine. So first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is I do a hypnosis track for 15 to 20 minutes and it'll just be about whatever. I mean, just anything really. So I'll listen to that hypnosis. I then wake up and I work out first thing. And then after that, I'll then go for a little bit of a walk for like 20 minutes while I take a call with one of my team members. Then I get back and then I'll have my first meal of the day. And then I get on with my most important unit of work. And then 
after that, it's a case of just making sure that I'm being proactive rather than reactionary. But sometimes you have to react when you have a team, you know what I'm saying? So I think it's just these habits that become your identity. I think that's one of the most fundamental things as an entrepreneur or just someone who wants to live a life of fulfillment is absolutely necessary. In what ways are you weird? <laughs> um, I don't even know. Like, if, if anyone knows me, you just, you just know I'm weird. I'm just, a, I'm just like strange, you know, but <laughs> I don't care. Um, I'm just myself, you know what I mean? Like, if I want to say something, I'll say it. And I'm also not rude about it, you know what I mean? Like, some people are rude. There's a fine line between being yourself and being rude. I'm, I'm definitely not a rude person. But if I, I don't know, it's, it's a good question, actually. Um, I just, I'm just, I'll just do random things and I don't really care about what people think about me. I don't know, just, just random stuff, you know? I think everybody should have non-negotiable weirdnesses about them that other people think you should work and fix, but I think they're part yeah. of who you're supposed to be. I think weird people are taking over the world. People like Elon Musk and these guys, yeah, they are this, exactly. these quirky, eccentric types. When you look at it, they're taking over the world. I don't know what'll come next. Uh, Donald Trump and so on. These people are getting in charge. <laughs> I know, exactly. Well, I think, you know, even just, I'm trying to think of some random examples. But for example, like, nah, I just can't even think of anything. But whatever. In the last few years, Lauren, um, is there a new uh, belief or habit you've talked about that has most improved your life that you could think this for me has been a game changer, that new belief, that new thinking, or that new habit that I've added to my life have been game changers. And do you think there's something that everybody could tap into, the things that you feel have worked for you? Yeah, shifting your identity through repetition, right? Okay. I think that's really what it is. You go to the gym, you lift weights, you put in the reps, you get stronger. It's oh. just the same when it comes to your life. And so, I think it's a case of realizing which direction do I want to go in? And if I was the type of person who was already there, what would I be doing? I think it's a case of asking the right questions to yourself. So many people have a problem. For example, oh, I'm not making enough sales. Okay, and then they stop there. But instead of saying, I'm not making enough sales, imagine if you said, what could I do to increase my sales? Or imagine if you said, what would my competition do to increase their sales? How can I get more sales? Why am I not getting enough sales? It's asking yourself questions around these particular topics. And so what I'll do every day is I'll take a problem that I have. For example, I'm not making enough sales. And then from there, I will pick one question to ask myself. For example, why am I not making enough sales? Then from there, I'll go down the spider web to answer that particular question right mm -hmm. so i'll say why am i not making enough sales okay i don't have enough leads and then i'll keep going down into the potential reasons for why am i not making enough sales and then once i've got this sort of like this spider's web of things then i'll go to the next level and so for example one of the answers was i don't have enough leads okay then i'll ask myself why don't i have enough leads and then i'll go down and make another spider's web and the answer to why i don't have enough leads might be i'm not reaching enough out to enough people per day on Instagram. Okay. And then from there, it's like, what could I do to reach out to more people per day on Instagram? I could hire someone who could do that for me. And then it's like, okay, how am I going to hire someone who could do that for me? I can find them here. I can, and all these, you get all the answers to the spider's webs. And so I do that every day and I compare all my answers. And then I go back up. Once I'm, once I'm at the bottom, I go back up the spider's web to figure out which answer is going to be the best for me then. And then I'm solving my problems every single day. Connecting and, the dots, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and again, I don't do this always visually. Sometimes I'll just do it in my head because mm. I don't need visuals. Like, I'm not one of these visual people. I'll just think about everything and it will go through my head and I come up with a solution. And it, suddenly if I'm like, bingo, sometimes I don't even need to do the whole thing. Suddenly I'm sometimes just like, bingo. I'll send a message to myself so I don't forget. It, and then we implement it immediately and actually take action on it. And I think a lot of people have ideas but they have so many ideas, they never execute on anything. And you don't need to execute on all of your ideas. If you do, that's gonna kill you off. I mean, I'd say the most successful people that I've come across, they say no more than they say yes, right? And so I think it's a case of just thinking, 
what is actually going to move me along and just executing on that as fast as possible. And so I would say that speed is my number one thing because at the end of the day, if you fail, fail fast. I know that's something, I think someone wrote a book about that, but if I'm going to fail, I'd rather fail now than later because you never lose your land. And so I, I want to learn to grow every day. If you could be mentored by anyone, mentored by anyone in the world, who would it be and why? Have you thought about, I'd love to get an hour with that person, that guy, that woman. If you could do that, if money wasn't an object or they gave it free, anybody in the world that you'd like to be mentored by and why? Yeah, that's an awesome question. I would definitely say Bill Gates. Okay. But I think what he and his wife have done through their whole foundation is just so powerful. And yeah. it makes me excited. It like, even gives me goosebumps thinking about it. The fact that they've been able to give so much money for causes that are meaningful to them is just incredible. The one thing, I mean, they're pretty big on vaccines. I still am not sure how I feel about that. Controversial. Yeah. I don't know. Again, I'm still, I'm, I'm, I don't know enough about the whole thing. I just, I don't know. <laughs> um, so I don't know yet about vaccines, but I just love the whole, the money that they've been able to donate. I think it's just insane. And it shows you, you know, people think that people make, who make a lot of money are evil and all this stuff, but mm. it's really, it's really not true. And I think that being able to speak to him and let's say he was like fully just going to tell you anything. I would love to get the intel about all these things that are going on in the world. Cause let's be real. He knows stuff about the coronavirus and about 5g that we human beings here on this earth don't know right. about. and so right. i want to know the the stuff you know i want to be able to get into the minds of people who who have this that they're, they're these like ha, such high level like business people they just know these things and so i want to yes. be able to get them what's your hobbies how do you chill out i love going for walks every single day i go for a walk i mean I love seeing my friends, <laughs> um, yeah. but obviously, you know, that can't be done right now. During the yeah. coronavirus pandemic, right, there are some people who are going to be listening to this in the future, okay? Yeah, yeah. But right now, my life literally, and my CEO said this to me the other day when I was on the phone with him, and it just made me laugh so much because I was saying, like, okay, give me some ideas for content to film. And he was like, well, because he, he's from Chile, and he was like, Lauren, let's be real. Every day right now, all you do is go for a walk, work, and work out. And I was like, oh, that's kind of sad, isn't it? But, you know, I don't really have anything else to do right now. But, um, right. It's just, that, that's just what I'm doing. And so my hobbies, I love going out to eat. That is my favorite thing to do. Like, literally my favorite thing, and traveling, but that's sort of a consistent thing. And when I travel, my favorite part is, like, going out to eat and making content. They're, they're my favorite things to do. Very cool. And next five years, plans, ideas, what do you want to be doing within five years? Yeah, so I'm really at a space in my life now where I'm taking myself out of working in my businesses yep. to work fully on them. And then ultimately, I don't see myself selling them because I have my coaching company and then I have a lead generation company where we focus a lot on LinkedIn, right? But I don't see myself, you know, stepping out or selling them by any means. I do want to start buying and acquiring companies, growing them and then selling them. And so that's really my next step. So I have a mentor who's helping me with that. And so I'm going to focus on buying online businesses, merging them together, scaling them, selling them. And I'm really excited about it because I was going to go down the property route and start investing my money in property. But I realized my skills are around business and online businesses. And so especially while I'm young and like I have energy and I'm still excited about it and it's still growing super fast. It just makes more sense for me to do the whole online business buying, selling and so on and so forth because the margins are much higher. Yeah, there's more risk, but I, I'm not afraid of risk. <laughs> and because I have my other two businesses who are bringing in consistent cash flow. And then from there, after five years, that's probably when I'll start getting into property. Um, but yeah, that's sort of the direction that I'm taking. Very cool. How can people find you, uh, the listeners, Lauren? How can they find you, social media, and what you're up to and so on? Yeah, so 
any platform, Lauren Tickner, L-A-U-R-E-N-T-I-C-K-N-E-R. So you can find me there. I also have a podcast called Impact School. So if you just type Impact School into any podcast provider, then you'll find it. Um, my favorite platform right now is definitely LinkedIn, but things change fast. So we'll see. Yes. Listen, I want to give you a massive thank you for your time today and for hooking up and eventually getting on our Zoom call together. And uh, I really wish you well in everything you are doing. And I want to thank you again for the time you took to come to my event in London a few years ago. I appreciated you coming to the masterclass. And uh, I've kept watching what you're doing ever since then. I think it's very exciting what you're doing. And I wish you so much success for the future. Thank you. No, I appreciate you. Likewise, I think what you do is great. And it's just incredible to see the impact that you're having on people's lives. So yeah, I just want to commend you for that because it, it's truly, truly incredible. And just goes to show what you can what you can do. You know what I mean? People should realize right. we're just two everyday people. You know what I'm right. saying? Who have just right. decided that we're going to make it happen. And I think yeah. that's, that's where a lot more people could be living the life that they want to be. I agree. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks for your time. Take care. Speak soon. Well, thanks again for listening to today's podcast. I hope you found it beneficial. And uh, I know time is precious commodity for us all, but I would love it if you would take the time to write a review or comment. And above all, maybe subscribe to my podcast channel. Thank you.